Okay, good afternoon. I have a video that I hope the sound has been successfully turned off. I apologize if not. So I'm going to be talking about shallow offshore tsunami deposits and talking about uh, finds that we've had from the eastern Mediterranean, specifically Caesarea and uh, Palacostros Crete, um, as well as uh, the northern Red Sea and the Gulf of Eilat Aqaba. This is an area of research that naturally uh, so much of the tsunami sedimentological research has been done onshore because naturally this is where the inundation area is and this is the area of interest to understand damage and, and risk. Um, and the offshore, I think, in, in some ways has not been as addressed as thoroughly. Being, and I'm going to show today sort of some of the finds that we've had offshore, some of the complications that we run into, and in many ways in a continuation of what you've heard in this session as well as uh, earlier today, um, in many ways how it's more of the same as far as what we're seeing um, on the coastline and inland. So before I for, don't have time at the end, I just want to acknowledge that this is work that has been the active research of multiple collaborators and students um, in my laboratory and, and collaborators uh, such as Kosa Sinolakis and, um, and uh, the Antiquities Authority in Israel as well as all of our students. So in 2006, shortly, you know, not too long after the 2004 tsunami, there was a publication in EOS that uh, summarized what we knew about paleo tsunamis at the time, and there was a sentence there that <coughs> grasped my attention because this was an area that I was working in that asked the question, another question to ask is, does a record of paleo tsunamis exist in the near offshore stratigraphic record? So of course, I, I hope that uh, in what I'm showing today, and we'll be able to show, have some answer to this question in all of the information that we've gained since 2004. So going back even further in terms of offshore records in general, it's nothing new. Um, as early as 1981, we have the, the work of uh, Cassins and Sita and, and the follow-up work by Sita talking about the homogenites found in the deeper realm, um, which were attributed and attached to a tsunami event. We also had modeling discussions within the models, Weiss and Balberg in 2006 and again in 2008 from Weiss, talking about the theoretical considerations based on linear wave theory that in fact we may have deposits offshore that uh, in fact may have been confused for storm deposits that could in fact be tsunami deposits. Though they generally uh, suggested that the likelihood of preservation would be in the greater than 65 meters because of, of course, the impact of storms um, in, the, in the shallower realm. Um, Ambrantes uh, showed that they could recognize in 90 to 96 meters, could recognize the earthquake and tsunami of 1755, which affected uh, the, the Lisbon-Portugal uh, tsunami and earthquake. And we also had the work by Vandenberg, and, and by no means is this, of course, comprehensive what I'm showing, but I'm just giving a few examples. Um, with Vandenberg, where we have shallow marine tsunami deposits that were collected from 10 meters, you know, going into really this shallower realm, showing that there was some preservation and that this could be attributed to the, the 1883 erup uh, Krakatoa eruption and, and tsunami. So in Caesarea, Israel, at the, around the same time in 2006 was the first publication of tsunami deposits from the shallow realm from excavation work that was done between 10 and 12 meters water depth. And at that time, the tsunami was interpreted uh, in many ways very much within, a, within a, a, with, with no parallel studies, a, a real lack of ability to be able to necessarily define it by comparing it to other um, other examples that were proven examples of tsunamis, of course, because this was uh, prior to 2004. But what was summarized then was that there was a tsunami deposit that overlapped with the historical description of 115 AD, um, and that it, this was done basically based on shell taphonomy, on a shell, uh, electronist shell deposits, the dating, and the structure of the deposit. This was followed up um, by a second study, which did a whole series of cores, about a half dozen cores, going away from that initial excavation area and resolving one of the problems, which was how to get a long core in sandy sediments. And this was done with a percussion, a hammer percussion core, and as the method was uh, perfected, the ability to collect up to five or six meter cores using this method. 
And at that time, the study was done by comparing it to diagnostic criteria, sort of summarized from all of the on-land studies and then comparing it to the sediments from those cores. And the conclusion not only confirmed this 115 deposit, but then recognized two other deposits, one that was sometime in the realm of between the 5th and, and 8th century AD, and one that uh, over, overlapped with the age of the Santorini eruption. Now, still at this point, the study could only, oh, excuse me, um, and then going forward from that, more cores were taken, instead of from the 15 meter and the 20 meter realm, cores were taken from the 30 meter realm. And in the 30 meter realm, lo and behold, it was found that the depositional rate was much higher and that there was a tsunami deposit that had not been recognized in the previous study and it was much younger and it was a, and it, although it did correspond with something from the historical record. Now, how that was addressed, how that was assessed was that the in agreement with some of the modeling, although at much shallower depths, the idea was that perhaps if you have smaller tsunamis that leave, for whatever reason, are leaving a, a smaller deposit, that perhaps over time those deposits don't preserve as well in the shallower depths where there's the, the storm influence, but they do in fact preserve in the deeper depths. And this is what, what has been theorized in ongoing work from the find of this, of these, this deposit being preserved. And so the study moved on and also found that in the very shallow, so we're talking about one and a half meters to about three and a half meters water depth excavations in this very, very shallow area, there was a very confusing uh, issue that with, there was a tsunami deposit clearly over a, a harbor deposit, which was over the earlier 115 deposit, but it had a mixture of it seemed like multiple phases of ceramics. So this very, very odd situation that seems to be the case where you have tsunamis that are occurring close enough in time that the deposit is being combined. On land, this was also seemed to be further confirmed when looking at the earlier archaeological reports that there were distinctive deposits for a tsunami in 551 and in 749, so about a 200-year gap. And what's believed is that this 200-year gap simply was not enough time to have enough sediment to, to create a protective surface, surface over the 551 event in the shallows, and so those two, those two events have been essentially merged in the near offshore record. So still the question of how do you differentiate these from storms? How are we dealing with that issue? In the earlier study, it was done simply by seeing uh, per perturbations in the, in the grain size of the cores that, didn't, that went away with depth, whereas the tsunami deposits remained. Well, in 2010, we were lucky enough that we had the largest storm that had been recorded in, in memory, um, and we had done a, a transect about four months before the storm, and we were able to follow it up with a transect afterwards. And the, the grain size, this is from zero to eight meters uh, surface collections and 26 to 30 meters, and we found that as far as the grain size went, they were, they were essentially identical. So concluding from there, we found that in Caesarea, the size of the deposit and the preservation in the shallows it is, a, is going to be a problem of how much is the time interval between the, the events, whether or not we can have the issue of these deposits being sort of merged, and that ultimately their preservation is, depends on the size of the initial deposit, the time period between the events, and the rate of the post-tsunami deposition. So moving on to another site to show another example, we took cores offshore from Pelicostros where there, there are uh, tsunami deposits on the, on the coastal cliffs from the Santorini event, and we wanted to see whether or not we could see the continuation of these as well as consider the 1956 event. As it turned out, in all four cores, what was quite interesting is we had very, very different expressions of the 1956 event, but it was present, whereas it's, it's not as present on land. It's very difficult to find on land today. We unfortunately were not able to penetrate with our more uh, primitive methods that we were using there by necessity. Uh, we, we seem to have actually hit the Santorini deposit but not penetrated according to the dating. But what we found from here is that while we were able to recognize the 1956 event, it was incredibly variable from core to core. Sometimes we saw the influence of the river, the tsunami going into the river and in the, in the discharge bringing out the river dis, uh, uh, deposits resulted in having basically like a flood-like deposit, whereas in other areas, because of the seagrass, we had very coarse deposits and the same thing, even the micropaleontology varied but was always uh, left a marker. So moving over to the Red Sea, um, in the Red Sea study, we collected cores from the northern beach, which is this area that has, is typically it's, it's quite uh, dry, but, but periodically we have floods. And 
in the lower area was just north of um, this coral area. Now, in the northern, the cores from the north, what was discovered is there was a section about 40 meters thick that had a very, very subtle but larger grain size, and um, in some, in, in part of the deposit was lacking forams or it had much larger forams, and we had the good fortune of actually running into a flood and being able to collect the flood deposits in order to make a comparison to the flood, and we did find that this was incredibly distinctive and had nothing to do with what we saw um, in the in the, uh, the the anomalous deposit. Towards the the core air the coral area that same, uh, dated to the same age, the anomalous deposit was incredibly different, full of heavy coral, shell, gravel, beach rock, and of course we're looking at basically a difference between the background sediments, the unique environment in which the cores were collected, but what we have in common, of course, is that the age of this event is the same. What we found to be very curious about the, the Red Sea was that we don't have a historical record for a tsunami at this time. It's from about 300 BC. But if we look into the historical record, it actually turns out that there's basically hardly anyone living there at that time. It's a strange gap in time, if you look at the archaeological record, where one site is abandoned, and it's before the, the port of Isla in Aqaba becomes, um, is basically constructed and becomes occupied. So what it seems to be is that we have no historical record, but it could very well be that we simply did not have a, a population at the time that would have recorded it. So what I would say is that you have the challenge, we have the challenges of the collection of the samples, which is something that can be easily overcome, and I welcome anyone to come and talk to me and please uh, apply these methods at your site. There's the issue of heterogeneity, and there's the is issue of pr preservation, and these are really issues that we see also in terrestrial sites. I mean, the benefits at the same time are some of these same things. You have, in many cases, far better preservation than we would ever have ex expected. We have a reduction of the anthropogenic influence. And that same issue of heterogeneity actually could be many times the calling card that, that helps us to recognize these deposits. So summarizing, a whole bunch of words up there, but basically, many times it's the exact same pr principles in the near shore, the near offshore, rather. We want to, there's going to be no smoking, single smoking gun. It's going to require many different proxies and many forms of analysis, and even within the same site, and even within the comparisons from core to core, because you're going to have expressions sometimes of the same proxy in different ways, depending on the circumstances. Um, and also, it's incredibly important to study all of the contributing background uh, contributors to the system, that this is the only way to be able to eliminate all the possibilities of storms, floods, or whatever the unique circumstances are of that particular site. And a lot of attention needs to be spent on the ways that these proxies are looked at. So in conclusion, the near offshore record presents, I believe, a rich and significant database that could be contain life-saving information. And I say that particularly because as populations are growing and as people are living, we now have cities and people living in coastal areas that have barely been occupied before, and there might not be a historical record. In fact, usually there isn't any sort of historical record, and that this might be a means to be able to address that when we have a lack of a historical record. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it was also a perfect timing, so we have uh, time for questions. Please. Yeah, I think that the, the oh sorry, the question was whether or not we tell me if I'm correct that whether or not we see the 551 event in our deposits. Yeah, I do believe that our, our, um, we, we have pretty tight dating on the, I mentioned that there are two tsunamis in Caesarea in that time range, there's a 551 and a 748. The 551 actually does have a historical record that, that refers to Caesarea specifically for its tsunami, and, it, and we have some pretty nice uh, uh, archaeological data that, that constrains the age. So I think we do have the 551. As a tsunami, not as an earthquake. At Caesarea. <laughs>